Hello, beautiful people. So I'm David, pronouns are Z's M. I'm the deputy director for Black and Pink, and I'm joined today by Nikki Zapp and by Dr. Jay Irwin. Um, and today we're going to be talking about a very uncomfortable topic. So strap in, grab, grab a warm beverage. We're going to be talking about anti-blackness today. Um, and no, we're not going to fix racism today. <laughs> we're not going to fix anti-blackness today. Um, but we are going to have some very uncomfortable conversations. Um, and over the last few months, our news feeds, whether it's like on CNN, um, on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, it's been really dominated with conversations on race in America. Um, pretty much everyone has used this label to talk about anyone from George Floyd to um, Brooklyn Deshauna, Felicia Harris, and other black trans lives that have been taken this year. Um, also Maude Ar Arbery, Stephen Clark, um, and other black people whose lives were stolen away by violence. Um, and it's not just violence that, um, that we're seeing. It's also inadequate healthcare, um, food, housing, employment, um, all these things that are labeled as uh, racist. And today we're gonna be teasing apart why it's much bigger than this, why it's much deeper um, than being racism and why it's actually anti-blackness. Um, because these are anti, these anti-black moments are not just one-off moments either. They're kind of built into the fabric of our country. Um, and so today we'll, we'll chat a little bit about anti-blackness, what it is, um, then we'll go into the legacy of anti-blackness and the, and the trans and queer rights movement. Then we'll go to work on confronting some anti-blackness in ourselves and in the movement. And then we'll leave y'all with some action items for how to move forward with this. So Nikki and Jay, can y'all both take a moment to kind of um, talk a little bit about yourselves, including your pronouns? Doesn't matter who goes first. Yes, first, Dr. Jay Irwin. Oh, okay, okay, fine. Um, so hi, uh, my name is Jay Irwin. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Um, and I am a transplant from the South, living in the Midwest. I grew up in Alabama. Um, so my lens for um, understanding this topic comes from living in a place where uh, there's a lot more diversity than where I currently live um, in Nebraska, which is incredibly white. Um, in terms of what I do, um, I'm a medical sociologist, but I study LGBT health um, in general, um, but I also teach classes in LGBTQ studies, um, trans studies. Um, I'm teaching a new class this next spring called LGBTQ health, which I'm really excited about. Um, my uh, area of kind of study is uh, essentially queer and trans well-being, um, and uh, I'm excited for this conversation today. Yay! Uh, my name is Nikki Zapp. I use she, her, first pronouns. Um, I am the executive assistant and facilitator for Black and Pink National. Um, I am a white, cis, queer, disabled woman with a chronic pain condition. I use a mobility device. Um, and uh, all sorts of other identities, but I think that those are the ones that are, um, that I'll probably be talking about most in this as we're chatting today. Um, and I have about, ooh, 10 years professional experience, um, facilitating, educating, talking on um, issues of the isms and bias, um, oppression, systems, et cetera, um, and about almost, no, yeah, my first activist, my first action as like a social justice person was at age 16. So technically, I'm, I've been doing activism for 20 years. Jay, we're so old. Um, so I get to work with David uh, on a daily basis. And Jay and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, 10? No. 7? 10? Some, somewhere around those years. Between 7 and 10. Um, <laughs> between 7 and 10. Doesn't matter, really. Um, and have, um, so I'm from Omaha, Jay transplanted from uh, Alabama to Omaha, I transplanted from Omaha to San Diego, um, Southern California, and um, in Omaha, Jay and 
I collaborated, worked together on all sorts of things. Um, so many queer things, trans things, um, and in particular were something that I loved was um, adult facilitators together for Proud Horizons, which is a youth trans and queer social support group that's been around in Omaha for over 25 years. Our uh, Black and Pink's executive director, Dominique Morgan, actually went as a young person, which I think is really amazing. Um, but there are lots of other awesome things. I also want to just give a real quick shout out that Jay is also the first openly trans elected official in the state of Nebraska. And I think that that is one of the coolest things ever. Um, and so I really like giving him props for that publicly. Thanks, Nikki. That's wonderful, Nikki. And Nikki, yeah, I, think yeah. that, I think that you naming your privilege is kind of a great segue into us, like, um, talking about anti-Blackness, because I think that's one of the things is, like, we talk about racism as this big, like, racism is bad. Don't get me wrong, racism is bad. But also, I think we need to do a better job of naming, you know, anti-Blackness, because when we're talking about anti-Blackness, we're talking about specific racism against Black people who are, you know, it's not even it's not even arguable. It's 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 a fact that Black people face the most racism in this country, and I think that when we're talking about racism, in particular, when we're talking about anti-Blackness, um, it's important for us to name our privileges. So, Nikki, I think that you know, you starting and naming like, hey, I'm you know, I'm a disabled person, white cis, like all that is great because I think that is where you start to sit in that uncomfortability of who you are as a person. So, I want to open up the floor a little bit to talk about you know, what is anti-Blackness and then its impact on Black people? And it doesn't matter, we can, and we'll make this kind of like a conversation kind of conversation. I don't really want to do it as a structured interview. I hate doing structured interviews. Um, so yeah, let's just open it up and let's go. Okay. Um, I want to say real quick, so both our folks who are on Zoom and also on Facebook Live, please feel free to ask questions at any point in time. If you're on Zoom, there's a Q&A daily. You can put it in there or you can put it in the chat. If you're on Facebook, just put on the comments. We are uh, watching both. So please ask questions. Um, and I also wanna note that we are specifically doing this panel because we were asked by Dominique Morgan, who is a black trans woman, to do this, uh, this and this type of conversation amongst white folks who are and are wanting to be in solidarity with uh, black folks in particular, BIPOC folks um, in general. And so this is definitely, I, I want to really uh, uplift that, um, that at least for me, that's why I feel okay having this conversation in the way that we're having it um, publicly and using, like, I'm doing it through black and pink and things like that. Um, yeah, so if you have questions, please, please share. Um, I think that in terms of um you know there's so much like when i uh, of course um in talking about racism in talking about um anti-blackness um i think that something that rings in my head is like is colorism um very quickly when i think about anti-blackness um and there, we'll, we'll be having a panel, uh, Black and Pink will be hosting a panel in a couple of weeks that is um, brown, indigenous, people of color talking uh, about racism and anti-blackness. Um, and one of, um, one of the things that one of our panelists shared as we've been kind of chatting about these conversations is uh, that as a person who is um, AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander, um, they're like, you know, within the commun in communities of color, like I have the most privilege. And so I think that we have to recognize that even in, not even, but within each system of oppression, there are multi-layered systems of oppression. And I think especially when we're talking about race um, and especially when we're talking about race in the United States, um, I don't like using the, unlike the oppression Olympics thing, um, 
and I also, I think that there is, there are unique, various, huge, um, modern and historic discrimination against specifically black folks. Um, and so I think that that's why definitely it calls for special conversations, uh, specific conversations. What do you think, Jay? Yeah, um, I mean, I think when I think about anti-black racism, I think there's this misunderstanding of that, oh, well, it's just this specific type of racism that is almost like, oh, well, it's, you know, it's just microaggressions. Um, but I think that's a misnomer of what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about these large systemic historical um, institutions that have really perpetuated a ton of violence um, against Black folks in the United States. Um, and so it, it's, it's not just a, oh, why are you being so sensitive kind of microaggression conversation. It's a, it's almost impossible to talk about where this ends because it's, it's insidious. It's everywhere um, in terms of how this impacts Black folks in our communities around us. Um, so, and, and kind of prepping for this and thinking through how we were going to have this conversation today, you know, I, I did a little bit of refreshing on, you know, this is stuff that I read all the time, but I, I think this is a, a good time to like, what does this look like right now? There are so many things happening in where we are as a society right now in this moment in 2020, that it's really um, easy to get overwhelmed. So I wanted to take a moment and just like reground myself and what this, what this topic looks like and what this topic involves. Um, and it's, it's overwhelming the amount of individual concepts that we could bring into this conversation as evidence of anti-Black racism. Um, they're, they're, the list, it would take us as long as we have to just even like document what this looks like um, in, in our lives around us. Um, so we can do that historical look back in terms of, you know, literally chattel slavery to the Americas um, all the way through more contemporary historical accounts of the Tuskegee syphilis study um, to what we are seeing now in terms of contemporary conversation um, around po police brutality, the, the um, unequal impact of COVID um, on, on Black communities in particular. Um, so all of these pieces kind of come together to kind of help us understand, you know, when we talk about racism, I, David, I really appreciate the point that you mentioned earlier, calling out the specific groups that we are discussing is super important because otherwise it's just this kind of vague conversation and it doesn't have like the grounding in the specifics. Um, and there is some very specific context for what this looks like um, in this part of the world in this time period. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I kind of, you know, talked about where I'm at in terms of thinking through this topic. I think it's easy to get distracted um, and the racism is everywhere and all around us. Um, but, you know, we're specifically talking about those things that do impact black bodies in specific ways um, that are unique, but also interrelated to all of these other pieces that we're talking through today. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to say that mostly to be like, if you are overwhelmed with this conversation, yep, that's, that makes sense. That's where we're at. Um, it is overwhelming, um, but, um, and Nikki, I really appreciate that context of, you know, like we've been asked to have this conversation. We are not inserting ourselves into this conversation um, without, without the invitation to do so, um, which as white folks um, in this work is super important. So as a white, queer, transmasculine, identified person living in, you know, the middle of the United States on, you know, <laughs> all of the United States is indigenous land, but in this part of the world, literally the city that I live in is named after a native tribe. Um, so these kinds of systems are, are so much related to one another. Um, but I'm really glad that we're having this conversation about how this impacts black folks specifically. 
Um, and I'm really looking forward to that question around kind of LGBTQ intersection um, as it relates to, to this topic too. Right, and I think with these, and like, and Jay, I think to this really, you know, drill in your point, it's interlocking systems because this, and you know, and even though you were grounding it in this present moment, it's also helpful for us to remember that this is how it was designed. This is not by accident that 2020 is not the year that magically anti-blackness just showed up on our radar. That is not the truth. Like all the institutions that we have in today, like when we're looking at systems of mass incarceration, those were founded in slavery because they couldn't enslave black people anymore. They decided to find out another way to do it. And they did it through the 13th amendment. So first of all, so there's that piece. And then, I mean, and when we're even looking at these systems, it's also, you know, and it's, it's not even just like mass incarceration. It's also in housing. It's also in the access to medical care. It's, it's all these trickle down effects where essentially black people are seen as objects and they are objects that we can denigrate objects that we can shame objects that we can make to feel guilt and we can, you know, exercise our privilege and exercise our power over them because that's just the way it is. That's how human nature works. We want to be able to box people in and say, oh, well, we're quote unquote better than you. We're doing X, Y, and Z thing. And, and, and because we're better than you, then, you know, we need to make sure that you stay in your place. Um, and I think, first of all, it's really just fucked up. And I think just the impact of it too is like, Black people have never had a chance because we've always, white people, and you know, I'm speaking as a white person, I'm not speaking as somebody who's trans or somebody who's gender non-conforming, I'm speaking, you know, as a white person, we've spent our entire United States history putting, quote unquote, putting people in their place. I, if, I, I don't really fucking know what reason why, like it doesn't, like logically it doesn't make sense in my head. I don't, like, I, I'm not that person that understands why this is happening the way it's happening. Um, I don't understand this need to control. I don't understand this need to have power over somebody um, because I work with some of the dopest black people I've, like, I know, like Jasmine Tasaki, who works at We Care Tennessee, black trans woman, amazing woman doing great things in the South, um, or especially around HIV and AIDS. Dominique Morgan, who heads up Black and Pink, um, and is doing great things building innovative program, not only for youth, but for people who are coming out of jails and prison. Um, Mariam Kaba, who's doing great like restorative and transformative justice work. Um, you know, Patrice Colors with the Black Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter moment, like all of these, you know, fantastic Black people um, who are just setting the tone for the culture and setting the tone for the way that things can be and the way that things should be. And I think it's important that, you know, the impact of anti-Blackness is that we've basically stripped their agency to make decisions for themselves by putting into place these systems where we're restricting their access to just basic needs and restricting access to equity. And I think that that is kind of where that impact lies. And I'll shut up a little bit more so that way we can talk, you know, more about this legacy, especially when we're talking about like the trans and the queer movement. Cause I know that, you know, we're moving right along here, but I also want to, you know, step into a little bit of the trans and queer rights movement since we've talked a little bit about that history in general. Yeah, so in terms of, you know, kind of the, the legacy within LGBTQ circles, I mean, so much of what we talk about in terms of LGBTQ history has just been whitewashed. It's just been taken over and white folks have literally colonized um, the, the, the facts of queer history. Um, so when we, when we talk about, you know, the, the history, even just within the United States, um, how we depict Stonewall, the, the start of the LGBTQ kind of contemporary rights movement. Um, historically, we have very much centered white gay men, um, white cis gay men in that. Um, and of course, white cis men were a part of those early movements, um, but they were not the agitators. Um, they, by and large, um, these were black and brown trans women um, and gender nonconforming folks and gender expansive folks. Um, whose bodies had been policed over and over and over again, um, and to the point of eventually saying, "No, <laughs> I'm done, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess some stuff up. I'm gonna break some stuff um, to to show how police brutality is is not okay." Um, and and you know, so Stonewall happened in 1969, and by about 1971, 72, um, we have white almost completely white-centered uh, queer spaces in major cities. Um, that legacy is, uh, is palpable um, and we will still be trying to deal with it 
um, for a long time um, because, you know, queer history is not known unless you live in like a California where it's part of the curriculum. Um, and so if, you know, the only thing you get is what uh, the media shares or what movies look like, and dear God, we could talk about the Stonewall movie all day long and how terrible it was. Um, and just kind of how these narratives get written. I didn't um, watch it. I refused. It. Same. Me too. I um, felt because I did, we didn't need to. But I'm also thinking like Milk, right? Mm -hmm. The Harvey Milk documentary, which is the, or not documentary, biopic, which is the first, maybe, like, LGBTQ about a historical figure that I remember being somewhat in the mainstream, right? Um, and again, like, you know, white, cis, gay man, great man, did great stuff, like, awesome. And also, that's who, that's who is palpable enough to portray to the mainstream, um, which is coded language for white folks, right? Um, in order to say, like, hey, this is, these are trans and queer people, too. This is LGBT as well. Um, and Jay, I, I popped in and stopped you there. I want you to keep talking because I could just listen to you. Oh, no, I don't even know. It, it, you're totally fine. I mean, I, I think that, that you're, what you just ended on, that kind of acknowledgement of intersectionality is a huge piece of this. Like when we talk about LGBTQ folks, I think for the average um, person, unless they're really invested in this conversation, just thinks of a white cis gay man. That's that because that's what we've been sold by all of these various institutions. Um, so we don't even have the language to think about. Oh well, you know what? Hey, guess what? There are black queer women as well, and there are black same gender loving identified folks. I mean, even when we talk about the language that we use as default um, within the queer community, the fact that most of the identity labels that are the ones that we discuss the most are our white European normative language. Um, so we could talk about even, even the concept of homonormativity, like what kinds of gay narratives are out there and acceptable. Um, they're often white gay narratives. Um, and I, I say gay in kind of the, the more kind of blanket term, um, which is, you know, a shorthand that I probably shouldn't use. Um, but unfortunately, that's where we're at too. <laughs> Right, and I think too with this piece too, and it's not to I say that I also, and it's not to say these accomplishments shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't, and it's not to say these white accomplishments aren't important because they are, but also it's about recognizing that we've held this privilege and we've held this power forever, and it's time to cede that. Because I like, where are the conversations on Audre Lorde that are happening in mainstream? Where are the com like it took what thirty years before people realized that Bayard Rustin was the architect of the National Wa March on Washington, that Bayard had been criminalized and policed in California for years, like. Where's the conversation on, uh, man, her name, the one who wrote Raisin in the Sun, who I can't remember her name right now off the top of my head and I feel terrible about this, but like living a lesbian, a closet lesbian life and then her like husband took up her writing after she died. Oh, Lorraine Hansberry, thank you, Cassandra, I appreciate it. Um, and her husband took up her writings after, after she died to the point where it got a little confusing as to who was writing what. And it was like, it's, it's that erasure that, I, that doesn't sit well with me. Like Marsha P. Johnson, um, Miss Major, like Storm uh, De, La, uh, De, La Ve, De La Ve, I can't pronounce the French name. I, like the lisp already kills me <laughs> as a gay person. So <laughs> like, but it's like all this erasure of like black queer people, black trans people, like just wonderful. And it's like, when, when is it going to be their time to shine? Like, why are we still hiding behind these narratives that white is right? Like, these people, like, with Marsha, with her and Sylvia, they, they founded the first um, LGBTQ space for youth using the Street Transaction Action Revolution, uh, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. There we go. Um, and they built it by, by selling their bodies. Like, they did it by doing sex work, by, you know, giving of themselves so much. And the response was that we pretty much erased them from the entire like 
history of the trans and queer rights. And this is, these are our elders that we're talking about. Miss Major is still living. I, I love Miss Major to pieces. She just announced that she was having a baby with her partner and is adorable and I love it. But like, she's building like House of Gigi in Arkansas, like doing all this great work in the South. And it's like, where is her kudos? Why, why are people not that, why, why is she not being mentioned in mainstream? And I think it's a fault of our own to like not confront that, to not name our privilege, to not, you know, not feel comfortable sharing that spotlight where we need to be sharing it. And it's, and it's not uplifting those narratives that need to be heard. Um, and again, it's not to say it's not important that these, that these white accomplishments aren't important, but I think it's also time that we put those to the side and think about, you know, black voices that need to be uplifted and black voices that need to be heard, especially the trans and the queer ones. And Nikki, I cut you off, so go ahead. No, don't worry about it at all. Um, I think we're going to be talking, like one of the last questions that we have that, that we've been pondering together is on action items, but I think that it's also good to like sprinkle some in here. So some very simple things like uh, Black and Pink, we're taking this month of uh, October LGBTQ History Month, we're uplifting um, voices and specifically focusing on uh, Black trans and queer voices. Um, and so you can see um, Bear Dresden, you can see um, Bell Hooks, you can see, you know, all of these different amazing uh, Black trans and queer folks, um, and they're just incredible things that they've said and things like that. So that's one little thing that you can do, you know, read those and share. And if there's one that you're like, wow, I didn't know that about any of the people that uh, David or Jay just mentioned, you know, like, take some time, right? Like, there, there are pieces written about and written by these folks um, all over the place, not to mention videos and all sorts of things. Like, you can go into a hole learning about some folks, like, take the time. Um, I think that's really, really important. Um, I'm thinking also, like, in the term, to just pivot a little bit, like, thinking about... Um, the term legacy, right? Like a trans and queer legacy and that we're part of that, right? Like legacy means pre previous, but it also means future and what we're doing now to be what that means in the future. And I think the big things, right? Like these big, amazing things, um, excuse me, accomplishments. Um, but I'm also thinking like, I've been thinking so much lately about the little things that happen within the trans and queer community that each of us perpetuates. Um, I'm very fortunate that I've never been on, well, I feel like I'm fortunate, um, but that I've never been on, like, on Grindr. Um, but every person I know who has um, talks regularly about the anti-Black specifically language that is just seen as A-OK, -okay, like normal within um, that, on that platform, right? Like no Blacks is like people literally write that. And I just think for me, I mean, that's something that I can't it, like, it, it just like, it so grosses me out, but when it's when it's um, normalized, validated, that's just how things are in the community, right? Um, and so it's definitely that, right? Like it's those little little things, um, but within the the trans and queer community, um, one of the things that I hear so often from my Black queer friends is loved ones, not even just friends, my family, is um, the feeling of not truly fitting in within the trans and queer community, whatever that means, right? Um, that if you're at um, if you're at a pride parade or you're at any sort of LGBTQ event, it's majority white folks, 
um, which also means majority white culture, um, respectability politics, um, all sorts of different things, especially when we're talking about like middle America. Um, you know, I haven't been to Pride in like NYC or even here in Southern California because COVID. Um, and so just thinking about what, how are we contributing to anti-Black within our LGBTQ spaces um, by it being predominantly white, by just assuming that, oh, well, of course I'm not racist, or of course I'm a co-conspirator because I'm queer. And it's like, absolutely not. Like I see so, so much anti-Blackness from fellow white queers um, because we have this like, well, I'm oppressed, so there's no way that I could oppress somebody else. And that's just not, I mean, it's false, categorically false, right? Um, and I, and so that it's, so it's something that we as uh, trans and queer folks really have to pick up the mantle on um, recognizing our privilege um, and not just our privilege, but how we benefit from and perpetuate the system of, of white supremacy, um, both within the LGBTQ community and the community at large. We have some different things. Let's I get a question from somebody asking, and I'll answer. This, like we can start, we can actually answer this one. Um, what books or articles? Somebody asked the question about what books or articles. Um, I'll start by saying anything by either James Baldwin or Roxanne Gay is always great. Um, if you're looking for something that talks a little bit about transformative justice and grassroots movement, look at um, Beyond Survival. Um, Ijaris Dixon wrote that. Um, um, check out anything. Let's see. I don't. Uh, there's White Rage, The unsp Unspoken Truth for a Racial Divide is another good one. Um, those are just a little of the recommendations I have. Jay, um, I know you do, you do a lot of um, trans and queer history. Yeah, so one of the books that I would encourage folks to pick up um, is a book called Black on Both Sides. Um, and it's specifically looking at kind of uh, trans history through the lens of the Black experience um, and, and kind of problematizing um, the, the lack of representation of black folks who are trans. Um, it's, and we can talk about this later, but I'm also gonna look, my bookshelf is like right over there. So as Nikki talks about some of her resources, I'm gonna literally go look at a book and go pick up something from us. So I am definitely, um, Like I, I'm an article reader. I read many articles a day, like through my scrolling. Um, I'm not as great of a book reader. I'm one of those people who will read like a chapter or two and then completely forget about a book. Not forget about it, but it'll sit there taunting me, telling me to pick it back up and read it for like a year. Um, so I think a big thing for me is uh, diversifying, but really diversifying the, my social media, right? Because that's the biggest like input of information that I get on a daily um, is, so I'm making sure that my, the pages that I like, the, the accounts that I follow on Twitter, on Instagram, like rep are, are, from black trans specifically like that is my kind of gold star standard um and then within those identities all you know other identities as well um but uh things like um well black and pink right um i think all so uh, Marsha's Plate, I've been um, following them on Facebook lately. Um, let's see, Roxanne Gay, I follow on Twitter. Um, she's just like, I just love her. And I just, I love her. 
Um, I also got to meet her once, and so we're besties, but not really. Um, well, like individuals, right? So um, Dominique Morgan, uh, Mariah Moore, um, Preston Mitchum. These are like contemporary uh, folks who uh, Jasmine Sasaki, um, who Kenyon Farrow. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Renee, Sonia Renee Taylor, um, um, Project Nia, um, gosh, and the thing is that once we start, for me anyway, like once I start following those, then the suggestions are other, like either orgs read, orgs led by black trans and queer folks or individual black, black trans uh, and queer folks. Um, and then also as I'm reading, like, um, you know, Dominique, for instance, will, will share things from somebody else. And I'm like, oh, like, I want to know more from that person, right? We have this really, like, there are some awful, terrible fucking things about social media. So many awful, terrible things about social media. And we can utilize it to our, we can completely use it to our advantage in these, in this specific way, um, in terms of diversifying the, the information that we are inputting into our, our brains, our bodies, right? Um, which absolutely affects how we perceive the world, what we're talking about, what we're thinking about, what we're sharing with our folks, right? Like anybody who is my friend on Facebook knows that at least once a week I've got a Facebook that just like post that says hey fellow white people like here's some shit right like because we got it we do have to talk to each other um we need to pick up the the mantle um of dismantling white supremacy because we're the fucking ones who built it and are continuing to build it like um <clears throat> and there's a really good question on Facebook and of course my phone come on recognize my face damn it and it's also um, not it's also like not just uh, about we built it it's about that we're profiting off it and that we're privileged to like it's more than just that we built it it's also that we are the ones who are profiting off of it but go ahead question from Facebook absolutely yeah uh, the question from Facebook is um, from Liz, white person here trying to navigate in various contexts, when to shut the fuck up, listen, follow, and when to speak, lead, take initiative. Thinking it's not a tidy either or situation, would love to hear the panelists talk about this. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. That is one of the most common questions that I get. Um, and also probably one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, myself i'd love to hear either of you and then we can jay you want to go i mean i think one of the things that i have used as a strategy a singular strategy is to figure out who are the people in my life and honestly nikki's one of them um of who i can talk to to process some of that as quickly as i can to try to make those decisions about how to engage when to engage um, what what my my role could be or should be, um, and this is a super difficult question um, because there is no black and white answer. There's no like this is what we should do always. Um, I think that context uh, is super important. So like in in regards to the my working environment, um, I think a lot about you know what are the things that that I can say that someone couldn't say without getting retribution for it. Um, and I, I think white folks are able to walk into spaces and, 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 and take up space literally um, and demand attention in a way, um, which is both a bad and a good. Um, if, if, it, if you are able to use those things um, to, to lift up voices that are not being heard in that space, um, I think that's one of those roles that um, a, a white co-conspirator could be um, influential for. Um, but it is a delicate balance of not speaking over folks um, and not um, uh, being able to continue to benefit off of that position that we have. 
Um, so if I'm invited to do something, my, one of my questions often, if it's a panel and we're supposed to be talking about race, is what is my purpose on this panel? Um, and who else is on the panel? If we're talking about race and it's a global conversation as a white person, that is a space that doesn't feel super comfortable unless it's for a purpose like this, where we're having white folks talk to other white folks about this kind of topic. Um, but the same can be true in terms of, of LGBTQ ask. Um, if there is a person who is just as knowledgeable on a topic, um, who is black or brown or indigenous or et cetera, um, making sure that I'm not taking opportunities from folks just because I'm an easy ask for someone um, is, is some of the ways that I've tried to navigate that. So this is something that I do, I deal with a lot at work here, um, especially because, uh, you know, Black and Pink's entire mission is to uplift the voices of, um, especially Black, black people. That's just, I, that's just literally our work. And I, I think this is a really important question. And it's one that doesn't have an easy answer, as Jay has mentioned. It's, it's one that is fraught with a lot of complications. There's a lot of challenges here. Um, and I wrote an article about this for our Black and Pink Inside members called Move Up, Move Up. Because I think, I think about this in terms of like community agreements, like how much, and, and it's also like also in terms of like at the table, like what's on the table, like what is the topic at hand? Um, who is at the table that's going to be talking about this? And then who needs to be at the table and thinking about like, what also do you benefit from sitting at that table that somebody else could? And how do you make space for them? Like, what is, and then it's also thinking about like, how do I lead into this conversation in a way where I can bring people with me um, and support them too? Because your privilege can also be used not only to make space, but also like clear space for people to stand up and say, this is my voice. Um, and I can share this article. Um, maybe I think we, I can work with our communications manager. Sorry, Dusty, I'm voluntolding you um, <laughs> for helping me figure out what this looks like. But this, it was a great article called Move Up, Move Up um, that just talked about like, just knowing where you stand in a conversation. Um, oh, and then there's one in there about Jay, I think, I think you just put in here about Sister Song, um, social media accounts for sexuality educators. Oh, and then this is back to that conversation from earlier. So I'll leave that alone. But yeah, I think it's just a lot of naming your privilege, owning your privilege and figuring out like who else's privilege needs to be, who else needs to have privilege be sitting at that table. Nikki, do you have anything, love? Yeah. yeah, I was typing in the chat. Sorry. <laughs> Jay, um, you sent that just to the panelists. Would you mind putting it in the chat for the whole, for the attendees also? Oh, okay. Um, yes. Uh, I think that one of the biggest things is about relationship. Um, like, Black folks are not a monolith. Um, and when meaning not every black person is the same and wants the same thing um and that i mean it seems like it it it, it feels ridiculous coming out of my mouth having to say that but like stats show that it's like 91 percent of white people do not have a meaningful relationship with a black person Right. Um, and so I often have to remember and recognize my, I, I, I consider it a privilege. I consider it an honor that I have multiple various deep and beautiful relationships with lots of black folks. Um, and and when I'm talking to other white folks, I have to remember that that is not a common experience, right? Um, and so, number one, I think that the answer to the question is about relationships. Like, do you have, are you building meaningful relationships with black people, <laughs> right? Like, if that's how, if, and, um, 
one of the things that I tell people sometimes, it, tell white people sometimes is like, if you have never had a real deep conversation with a black person about race, where they have shared um, truth, uh, authenticity about their experiences, you are not a friend. Like that is, you are, you are not a friend, right? Um, and, you know, that doesn't, like, yeah, it's, it's also not about collecting, collecting our Black friends, like, Pokemon, right? Like, oh, I have, um, it's about relationships. It's about building, having, and having relationships and building relationships, like, you know, um, because, and, and all of that to say, when I'm in the room with different loved ones, um, Oftentimes we've had a conversation where I've said, hey, when we're in this space together, if X, Y, Z thing happens, because we know that so-and-so is a jackass, do you want me to, do you want me to say something in that? How do you feel about that? Right? I'm, I have the relation, we have the relationship. And so I'm able to ask, I open up that conversation um, and then I know how that person, how my loved one, that loved one wants me to, to handle those types of situations. Um, uh, for, for instance, like one of my best friends, we were in, we started grad school together. Um, and so, and this is a, a black trans friend. Um, and so we had several conversations like talking about all sorts of things, but, uh, you know, from, um, race related conversations but also about pronouns like if they if they fuck up your pronouns like you know me you know that i'm gonna be the one who's like ah their pronouns are they them um but this person is like somebody who kind of likes to fly under the radar a little bit and didn't you know so so it's about the it's about relationships um i think some of my when, when i don't have a relationship with someone when this is you know someday when we get to like be in large groups of people that we don't know <laughs> together again, but also <laughs> um, on on social media, on um, whatever. Um, some of my different kind of like rules, not rules, but guidelines that I live by are if, number one, I'm always looking at how many Black folks and people of color are in the room. It's just something that I am constantly thinking about. Um, I used to work in a building that had lots of meetings all the time and had glass walls so you could see into the meetings. And so it was like, it was almost this game that I would regularly play. Like how many, how many uh, BIPOC are in that room? Like that's a board meeting happening. How many board members of color are there in there? Um, but so I'm, that's something that I'm always thinking about. And if there are not, and, and David, you can attest to this. Jay, you can probably attest to this as well in meetings that we've been in, where I have literally like just stopped a meeting and been like, hey, I just want to recognize right now that everyone in this room is white. Um, and I, I think that that's important. Um, we need to call that out um, with each other. And, and not as like a blame thing, but just as a like, this is something that we need to have in our head uh, uh, that is just as other cis women would be um, would be talking about uh, why aren't there any women in the room, right? Like that's not necessarily where my lens is, but my lens is definitely on um, how many black folks are in the room. Um, also, um one of my guidelines is the one there are uh and there should always be uh bipoc in the room if a question is asked to the group um i i'm going to defer to the black person like i i want to wait until they answer speak um before i do that's just something that I'm kind of thinking about in my head, like when am I the first one to speak up? Because 
um, it's comfortable for me, like I don't care, whatever. Um, and making sure that I'm making space um, for others. I remember years ago, I think Jay, you were at this as well, um, but Dr. Angela Davis came and gave a free uh, lecture in Omaha. And it was like super, I mean, packed, right? And she gave this incredible ugh, um, lecture and then gave it up for questions. And there were like two mics, there's thousands of people in here. There were like two mics set, set in the mid, in the, on the floor. And the first like three people at least in both, in front of both mics were white people. And I was so angry. Like I was so angry, like really Angela Davis is here and white folks, you're going to take up the space. Like, you know, she only has time for a couple of questions. Um, so that's definitely a like, make some fucking space people. Like it's not always about you. Um, and then absolutely what Jay said about if you're somebody who, what, whatever it is that you're asked to do, right? Whether it's maybe you're a pan, maybe you're somebody who gets asked to be on panels. Maybe you're somebody who, um, who is helps to hire people or is uh, who knows what, right? Whatever it is, right? Have a list of people in your head that you're farming things out to. Like if somebody asks me, um, you know, X, I'm looking for this person, uh, then I've got these, I've got folks in my head that I'm always thinking about who are black and trans, right? Again, like that's kind of my top tier. And then the next pieces. I hope that's helpful. Um, it's just a constant, it's a constant practice and we're never going to get it right. There's no right. We're just doing the best we can until we know better. And then when we know better, we do better. All right, thank you, Nikki. So we have about four minutes left. I wanna make sure that we stand to the time because I don't wanna run this off. Um, Jay, do you wanna provide any like last minute action items for how to confront this, um, confront anti-blackness in your life um, and just small steps for people to take moving forward? Yeah, so I would say um, all of the things that we've talked about already. I mean, I think listening more like actually listening more um, and, and not consuming things just for like, a, ooh, what can I take from this and like performatively share something on social media? Like deep reflective listening um, is hard to do, but I think it's very, very worth it um, and necessary in this work. Um, one of the things that I wanna make sure that I, I call out is thinking through how we frame um, conversations about equity uh, and race and diversity and if we're only framing, framing them as negative, that is something that is a problem and, and, and a system of anti-Blackness and a system of racism, a part of that, that system. Um, and I, the, the last thing I'd say is when we're talking about LGBTQ intersections with, um, with anti-Blackness is celebrate your Black siblings who are queer and trans while they are here. Stop only remembering folks when they have died. That is not helpful. I mean, it's a necessary part to make sure that we honor people. Um, but, you know, uh, those of y'all who know anything about the South, Monica Roberts is probably one of the biggest voices for trans and Black trans voices in the media. And she died very unexpectedly. Um, and it, it's gotten a little bit of attention. Um, but her work is super influential and super important. Um, and celebrate those folks while they are with us uh, instead of waiting until people are tragically taken. And I think I will close this out with, I think one of the easiest things you can do is just support black locally owned businesses, whether it's a nonprofit organization that's led by a black, uh, led, led by a black person. Um, I'm literally wearing this from, there's a black boutique that's here in Jersey City where I'm from. Um, and I love all her outfits. She's just got so much great stuff there. But like, and even if it's like going to a black owned coffee shop and getting a cup of coffee, or if, if it's volunteering your time, um, it's, it's supporting businesses that are black owned 
shows that you see them as humans, shows them that you see them as people who, you know, are deserving and people that matter. And I think that's a good, and I think that's something that we need to leave on. Um, and regarding Monica Roberts, if you want to know more about Monica, look up her blog, Trans Grio. Um, she's been doing this since I think 2006, if memory serves me right, but Monica has been doing this work for so, 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 so long. She was an influential person. Um, and yeah, we lost her unexpectedly last week and it was a huge blow. Um, but that said, Nikki, do you have any closing thoughts? We have about a minute left. Do you say that? Cause you know that I talk so much. I know that I talk so much. Um, I think everything that y'all just said, um, I showed my shirt, uh, Mahogany Mommies. I just, I saw them on Facebook and I was like, that is exactly me. Drink water, love hard, fight racism. Yeah, fuck yeah. Um, yeah, I think all those things. I think um, for folks who are parents or who are influential to children, if your child is white, they need to know about black folks. They need to know about um, especially black trans and queer leaders now and in history. Um, give, them, give them the gift of that now um, and not that they're in their 30s and realizing that this is, it, again, has been um, starved from them in public or private education. Um, so it's, this is about, like, I'm not a parent, um, but I have lots of young folks around me. Um, and so these are books that I buy for baby showers, uh, not gender reveals, because I don't go to those, because fuck them. Um, but, um, you know, I'm looking at those kids' books, like, are, am I choosing ones that have black protagonists as well as penguins who are in love with each other right like thinking about those kinds of things because we're normalizing normalizing um early right um and and not just talking about babies but also talking about your the the teenagers in your life the early 20s in your life um if they're in college like talking to them about, hey, what classes are you taking? Like, yeah, I know you're an economics major, but hey, maybe take that intro to sociology class. Maybe take that intro to LGBTQ um, history class. Um, those are really important things that we can do as well. Um, because I, I can't tell you how many folks I know who were like, I didn't even know that this was a thing until I had to take this class, right? Um, so go into that thinking about what you're sharing on social media, that's a big way that we're interacting with other people today. Um, uh, and continuing to follow Black and Pink and um, other amazing Black trans-led organizations, We Care Tennessee, Jars Mitsutaki runs that, um, House of Tulip down in New Orleans, um, Mariah Moore is one of the co-creators of that. Um, there are so many great organizations that you can be giving your money to, even if that's 10 or five, five or $10, it, it makes a big difference. I know that from, um, from experience, but then also following them on social media because they're um, sharing some really important stuff. And that's again, how we can uh, feed our brains. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jay and Nikki, for joining me today. Um, that wraps up everything. Thank you, everybody else, for um, popping in and sharing space with us today. We appreciate it. Um, this video will be live on our YouTube channel, I believe, once we get it uploaded. Um, and it's also on our Facebook page. Um, so thank you again. I hope everybody has a great afternoon. And there will be uh, another, there's a, a panel in two weeks. I think it's on the 28th. Um, uh, that is specifically um, brown indigenous uh, communities of color um, and, with, and talking about anti-blackness in those communities. We're gonna be continuing to do these types of educational pieces. We're gonna be continuing to do these white co-conspirator um, workshops because it's something that uh, Dominique has really asked uh, us to do, um, to be talking to white folks about how to be in solidarity and not be allies, which I 
is, is a lot. Um, and yeah, be good to each other, y'all. Drink water, love hard, fuck racism. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jay. Bye.